After a journey of about 48 hours, my colleagues and I have finally arrived in Antananarivo, the capital city of Madagascar, and we're very happy to be in possession of all of the equipment and materials needed to stop the world's rarest bird from becoming extinct. That bird is the Madagascar pochard, a diving duck which we thought went extinct about 1990-ish. Uh, it was rediscovered three years ago and we now know there's a lake with a population of fewer than 20 birds about 400 miles to the north of here. We know there are fewer than 20 birds living on this one lake and right now it's their breeding season. Last year no young survived and we know that three females have attempted to produce babies this year but all of the ducklings have died so far. The female has been sitting for three weeks now and she's due to hatch her eggs next week so it's a race against time. We have to get up there within the next seven days, set up, collect eggs and hopefully hatch some ducklings. Last, we were on our way. Madagascar separated from the mainland many millions of years ago, and over that time, the animals, the plants, the birds that have evolved there have turned out to be unique species found nowhere else on Earth. Madagascar's wildlife is in big trouble. There are pockets of vegetation, of habitat that remain largely untouched, but the majority of the country has been changed almost irrevocably by people. Large swathes of woodland have been chopped down. There are fires regularly throughout the island now to burn large areas for agriculture. The remaining wildlife is restricted to just a few pockets throughout the country. And the pochard has probably survived at this lake because it is so remote. Well, we're now about 300 miles north of Antananarive on the road that will take us slowly but surely to where the Madagascar pochards hang on. And we've ground to a halt again because uh, a bridge has collapsed and all the traffic has stopped. Well, hurry up and wait. We've been told that the bridge will open again on Thursday, tomorrow, and then we have a mad rush to the lake where the birds are. Our planning suggests that the eggs we're after are going to hatch on Sunday. So it's now Wednesday, we're getting closer, time is running out, but we're still, still going. We realised very quickly that we needed an international collaboration. We sent uh, our best expertise, we had Nige, who is Head of Conservation Breeding from WWT, along with Sparky. He's responsible for rearing the birds at Slimbridge. From the Darwin Wildlife Conservation Trust, there was Lance, Head of their operations in Madagascar for these sorts of projects. They have a lot of experience of dealing with uh, species on the brink of extinction. And Glyn, who's based at Jersey, and has been looking for this species for 20 years. We've also had a lot of help from the local authorities, from the local government and the Ministry of the Environment who are very supportive of our project. Uh, finally, we arrived. Finally, after doing 
750 kilometers. And we've arrived at base camp, the place where we're going to rear the ducklings once they're hatched. We had an empty hotel room where we had to build makeshift breeding facility. We had to buy plastic tubs off the street, tanks to rear the birds. We were doing everything we could in the short term to, to make it as similar to Slumbridge as we could. That's the best we could do at short notice, but it, it was good enough. Normally, we only open our doors to people, but this time we decided to extend our hospitality to ducks. And these birds are part of the richness of Madagascar, so we were very pleased to be able to help. Although the hotel is quite close to the lake with the last remaining wild birds, the journey takes a whole day. For the first three hours, the road is a road, but it's still got lots of potholes in. For the last 40 kilometers is a dirt track and only a horse and cart or a four-wheel drive will make it. We've just come around a corner. We've got a really steep drop-off on our left-hand side here, and we've come head-to-head -head with the, the ox cart. <laughs> We eventually got here. Uh, it was unfortunately dark when we arrived. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. Talk to the, the camp people, the people who are based here, to find out that the ducks have not hatched yet. And uh, now we're just ready to go and visit the birds. The rediscovery of this bird was really a lot of luck. The chance finding of it here was all down to the Peregrine Fund, who were looking for a very, very rare bird of prey, Madagascar Harrier. And they'd come to this very remote part of Madagascar. It was a little while after they'd set up the camp that the director of the Peregrine Fund, a guy called Lily Arison, when he went there, raised his binoculars and had a look, he realized here was this extinct bird, the Madagascar pochard, was in fact still alive. See the male on the right hand side. His eye gleams, shines like a diamond. We sent a guy called Cassidy, who works for Durrell, to keep an eye on the birds. It was his job to work out when they started incubating. Getting that date right was critical to the whole operation. Without you, we would not be able to begin to start to help this bird come back. The first day that the team could get to the lake was the day that the eggs were due to hatch. The team were waiting for the local dignitaries to turn up and see them collect the eggs. They were very involved in the project. And while they were waiting, saw a Madagascar Harrier go to the edge of the lake, dive down, take something, catch some prey, and fly past. We've got it. Got something? As it flew past the first time, Nige was saying that that sounds like a pochard duckling calling. So our fear was that this bird is eating the Madagascar pochard. Again, it went down into the corner of the lake, hovered, and they saw it disappear behind the reeds, and they could see through their binoculars that it was indeed carrying pochard duckling. So was it eating it on the wing? Was it a tiny duckling? Yeah, it was tiny. You're joking. No. Glenn has just been sick because that might have been the brood that we were about to collect as eggs. We've always thought Harriers were potentially the biggest threat. While that doesn't actually prove it, it does, uh, you know, I think that would stand up in a court of law, it probably is there. Not only did it mean the Harrier was eating the pochard, but worse than that, they had missed the brood of ducklings. The whole operation had been set up around getting there a day before they hatch. All of the planning, all of the shipping the equipment, all of the travelling to the lake was based on being able to get the eggs from the lake 
Once they'd hatched, now they were ducklings. There's nothing we can do with them. They are lost to the captive breeding program. Tulu works for the Peregrine Fund. He's been based at the lake for a couple of years and monitoring the pochards. He suggested that in fact it might be a different brood that we expected to hatch on that day. So he persuaded us to make sure you get in the canoe, go to that nest and have a look. And if we don't get any, if the eggs are gone, we just put the, collect the eggshells in. Yes. Bon chance. 20 years been looking for this duck to do something with it. 20 years exactly this year. Didn't they go? Okay, Lance, can you confirm that there is a nest with eggs? Uh, yeah, at the moment I can't really see the nest from where I am. It's uh, Tulu's inside the marsh. We have Internally pipping and externally pipping, so we're right on. Okay. Get in here. Fantastic. I cannot tell you. Just got the last one taken out, and we have nine. What a relief. That is absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. Well done. Brilliant. So I'm happy when he said they're here. I named my daughter after this bird 15 years ago, uh, and now we get to uh, achieve something equally as big. Two point nine. Fifty-two point nine. Yeah. Right. Forty point six. Weight is forty point one. Egg six is fifty-two point seven. That can feel someone tapping inside. Forty point five. And its mass is thirty-nine point nine. been a day of extremes, a day when we felt really quite depressed and a day that's ended with us feeling really very very happy. Hopefully all nine eggs will hatch in the next 36 hours or so. I'm going to leave it there because the light is fading fast. So what we're doing now is looking to see where the eggs have pipped, marking the time that we record the pip, and tomorrow we'll check again and see if the beak has moved and see if there's any more shell chipped. Just starting to break through the shell, you can see the beak tapping on the inner surface. You can see the baby inside moving. Excellent. Hopefully that's going to hatch very soon. What is fantastic news is that during the night duckling is hatched and there are others on the way. We now just have to, to make sure that the incubator stays at the right temperature and that we, we transfer the ducklings to a safe place where they can keep warm as they hatch. And maybe in the next 24 to 36 hours, perhaps sooner, they'll all be out. So I'm going to give it a drink, all right? First uh, to be seen, it's newly hatched, I think, ever. Fantastic. My main job on the on the trip is to look after the eggs, ensure they hatch okay, and then look after the, the young birds until the next uh, group of, of aviculturists come in and, and relieve us. All going well so far. I think it'll be out within half an hour. The important bit for us is to hatch the eggs at the side of the lake and then move the ducklings when they are just one day old. That's when they're least vulnerable to being bounced around on, on the ridiculously bumpy journey back to the hotel. Well, we're on cloud nine. We've collected the eggs. They're safely in the incubator, but we've still got some real concerns about transporting the ducklings. The road back to base camp is extremely bumpy. And originally we were gonna use this big, this big white box here, pad it all out. But we think using a smaller one and just keeping an eye on the temperature um, and then we can we can have a human as a kind of a dampener or a shock absorber. 
goes. My babies. Yeah. <laughs> Gorgeous. Special little guys. And girls. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like training all our lives for this. Yeah. Oh, that's what it's all about. Loving it. And their first feeling of being cold and wet, which is what being a duck is all about. We just had a very exciting 36 hours, and I have to say it was a very uplifting moment to see the birds behaving naturally, albeit in a cardboard box was drinking and splashing and bathing and, and eating for the first time. Uh, I think we all felt very positive about what we were doing. It's going to work. The lake is just over 120 kilometers away, but it took us uh, a full eight hours to get back. But we managed to get the birds back safe and sound this afternoon, and they're now safe in their, their rearing tank, drinking and bathing and just cooling down. The first week of a duckling's life is the most important, and that's when they need constant care. So the guys were sleeping in the hotel room with the birds so they could get 24-hour, round-the-clock care. They need all the things they would get in the wild. Normally the mother duck would sit on them and keep them warm, so we need heat lamps, so we need a good electricity supply. We need somewhere fairly secure to keep them free from predators, from rats, and we need constant and lots of water for them to swim in, for them to drink, and we need to keep that clean and fresh. stage for the Madagascar potsherd. They've spent a few days now being dry reared as we call it, which is where they don't get a lot of access to water. And we're making a wet rearing tank now. When we start rearing them in this water tank, when they come out wet, they'll drain off and, and they'll stay nice and dry as they sit on the on the car mats. We've got the drainage and the food there. They should hopefully pretty much look after themselves. Three years ago, I went to the Bimanivk forest to look uh, raptor species and uh, at the time I rediscovered the Madagascar pochard, a probably extinct bird with a Darrell world leaf and uh, the blue WT and the peregrine fond. I hope that this species will come back again with a lot of population. Local people are crucial to this project. 
In time, WWT and other organisations will pull back. At that point, we rely on local people to take responsibility for the wildlife. So in the meantime, it's essential we work closely with them and pass on the skills that they need to conserve these species. So we're off to collect the second clutch of Madagascar pochard eggs. Cassidy in the front. Lance in the back. Okay. <laughs> this is the female mm. leaving the eggs. This nest is just incredible. It's so dense and thick and tucked way down deep in the marine. At this point, the team was joined by Martin Brown. He's based at Slimbridge and he's one of our veterinary experts. Okay. Excellent. Good work, everyone. Nine eggs, all looking fertile. They look good. A little bit heavier than the first lot, but that's just because they're a deer behind the yeah. last lot. Yeah. The team had collected the second clutch of eggs and it was now a waiting game for them to hatch. 4.30, the frogs are still calling and the birds are just starting to sing. It's been a long wait, we've fretted a bit, they don't seem to, to be getting anywhere the more you look at them. Oh, seven's tapping. Well, just, just getting in there. Can you see its beak down there? <laughs> It's not quite in the tapping position, but it's. In air space. See it, you see it breathing. You see it actually yawn. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody in there? <laughs> it's uh, approaching sunset on our last evening at the lake. This place is a very special one, full of species that need help. There are serpent eagles. Madagascar Harrier, red owls, all critically endangered. There are very, very few wetlands that don't have people living alongside them, uh, fishing those, those wetlands and uh, using nets to catch the fish, which actually means that a lot of water birds, particularly those that dive for food, such as potchard, vulnerable uh, to drowning. Just now, I could hear thunder and there have been flashes of lightning and the major obstacle that we face is bad weather which will make the track out of here very treacherous and perhaps even uh, impassable. We really are hoping with everything that we have that the ducklings will hatch tonight. I've been driving myself crazy, checking temperatures, watching eggs that are slowly, slowly moving, sometimes not moving, looking as if they're dead, um, but we will just have to hope that during the night babies will come out and we'll be able to get up at first light and transport them safely. I'm actually going a bit nuts. I'm going to leave it there. I need to check those eggs. Right, the generator's going into one, but we've just spent half an hour fretting over these ducklings while Martin Brown is tapping the box. We're starting to talk ourselves into all the different scenarios and problems and when will we leave tomorrow, will we leave tomorrow, will we these guys missed their plane. Suddenly we heard it all kick off in there and we had a quick look. So now we're on a high again. Yeah, but it's moving about in there now. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. Fantastic.
The third clutch was not due to hatch until a week after the second, so there was a real dilemma. We couldn't risk a third trip because we knew rains were coming and the road would be impassable, so we took the decision to take the third clutch of eggs out at the same time as the second brood. The third clutch had to make the whole journey in an incubator uh, to make sure they stayed warm during the journey to the hotel. What's actually wrong with the car? Front wheel bearing. Front wheel bearing's gone. The clutch is knackered. We're limping into Anshuihi, where the hotel is, where the ducklings are going to find their new home. Can they drink it? Yeah. Right, we got back last night with the second brood and the eggs. Everything's going well so far for those birds and eggs, but we're now handing over to Owen Joyner from WWT Washington. He's going to care for the birds for the next three months at least. We just hatched the third clutch last night, and there's seven ducklings in it, 100% hatch, and that's brought our total up to 24. In this bedroom alone, this hotel bedroom, we have half the global population of Madagascar poachers. <laughs> extinction of a rediscovered species is about as rewarding as the job gets. We have taken the first step to save this species from the brink of extinction, but there is so much more yet to do. We need to go back to the lake and get more eggs in future years. We need to create a purpose-built facility to care for and rear these birds in captivity in Madagascar, and we need to identify the sites where in time we will release them back into the wild. soon have the species back on wetlands throughout the country, thriving throughout Madagascar as it once would have done several hundred years ago.